And my dad and I, you know, a lot of people say sometimes to me that know me, oh, it's so nice that you and your dad had such a close relationship. And I often look at that as kind of an interesting paradox because I don't necessarily feel we had a super close relationship when we think of just kind of the very human aspect of what close relationships look like. On the other hand, I have always felt that my dad and I, I used to just say on some other level, we just understand each other. And I think that maybe we just sort of let each other be who we are, even sometimes when that's hard, rather than having always dealing with particular issues. Um, we did, though, take a lovely trip together, and it's relevant to your question in this conversation. In 2006, I was in my 20s, and we traveled together to Machu Picchu in Peru. Um, I was in South America working on my master's degree, and when I was done, my dad flew down to meet me. And we both shared, and the reason I share that is because we both shared a love for other cultures, for ancient history, um, in particular for indigenous cultures. Uh, we were fascinated, both of us, by the Incan people, their archite architecture, and how they were able to build uh, the cities that they had. And I planned and organized that trip. Uh, we did a two-day hike through the Andes and up to Machu Picchu. And that journey is sort of like the spiritual journey that we are now on, in that at that time, I was the one who spoke Spanish, so I spoke the language of the country. And we, you know, got off the train to Machu Picchu in the middle of the Andes and just started following the path <laughs> without really having a guide in particular or, you know, a definite map and well laid out. We just knew we go this way and eventually we will come to this destination and so on and so forth. And the relationship that my dad and, ha and I have in spirit is sort of like that. He stepped off the train when he passed, but brought me through his guidance along with him on the journey in a way. And while he, of course, is having his own experiences in spirit, he has been guiding me to discover this path of the greater reality. And what, what is sort of this spiritual perspective? So my favorite moment on that trek that my dad and I did was when we got to what the Incans call the Sun Gate. It's actually the highest point on the trek above Machu Picchu. So it's much higher than Machu Picchu and it's the first time you can see Machu Picchu from the Inca Trail. And when you get to the top, you climb 100 vertical steps and you get to the very top and there is this beautiful sight and you sort of have this highest mountaintop perspective of, you know, what reality was in that case for, in part for the Incans. Um, and I think for me now, he has guided me down this path of having this higher perspective of life. Um, maybe that was a little bit of a muddled explanation and answer to your question, but I think it's important because we shared many things in common and we loved each other very much, but it was also a very complex relationship and things that, you know, were kind of left unsaid and done. Um, but now on this other side of things, I've really grown to learn who my dad is as a soul. And that's that's just a whole nother new aspect to our relationship. Yeah, I can imagine that just allows for perspectives that you probably didn't even imagine could be there. Absolutely. Um, it wasn't always easy. I felt sometimes like 
knowing this part of my dad was in a way causing me more grief because um, through, through the sense of spirit, through the life force that really is a part of all of us, he was bringing me into feelings of love and healing and just on such a profound level in ways that I didn't necessarily experience when he was here in physical form. I mean, I knew my dad loved me, but maybe because of some of our past experiences, how I perceived some of his actions, probably because there were things left unsaid and done. This sounds terrible to say, to say, but in a way it's like, I knew he loved me, but did he love me? I know what you mean. But I feel that. I felt that from him in spirit after he passed. I felt that he loved me. I could feel that. And um, I remember thinking in one moment, I wish I had this dad in life. And I don't say that because there was anything wrong with him in life. You know, we're very complex people. But when we take away all of the stuff that clouds up our perceptions of people and, you know, the stuff that causes us hurt and pain, it's all making clouds in our awareness of really the strength of this love that is here under people's mistakes, under their messiness and under their complexity is most often deep and profound love. And that's the dad that I got to feel in spirit that's so beautiful so tell me about when this switch happened well um in a way i guess it, it started with our shared death experience uh, as he passed from cancer my dad passed on 111 on november 1st uh, he actually passed away at about four in the morning ish Actually, he passed during daylight, si daylight savings time change here in Michigan in the United States, which is also quite an irony. He passed in a way when we're absent of time. But about 12 hours before he took his actual last breath, um, I was laying beside him in his hospice bed. I was just in a recliner. My, we were fortunate enough for my dad to be able to pass at home. So we had a hospital bed in, in my parents' living room. And I was just laying there holding his hand and I was having, you know, truly just a moment of immense pain because it's very hard being with someone who is passing. It's emotionally taxing, of course. And then it gets really difficult when, when you're in this space of he's here, but he's gone. I had already had my last conversation with my dad. I was never going to talk to him again, uh, and yet he's not gone. So it's a very difficult place to be. And I was thinking about the past and things left unsaid and done. I was thinking about the future and things that will never again be, and it was just such a place of pain. And I think, reflecting back, almost as a strategy, if you will, of escaping that pain, because the thoughts we're creating the pain, the thoughts of thinking about the future, the thoughts of thinking about the past. That is almost an unintentional strategy to just stop thinking. And all I could do was become fully present and focus on unconditional love. Because in the attempt to be absent of that pain, he was still my dad. He was still here in this moment. Here was still a hand I could hold and a man that I could love, which I, I, who I did love very deeply. And so I just became focused on that pure presence and unconditional love. And in that moment, I suddenly saw, because my eyes were closed, of course, as I'm kind of laying there holding his hand, I saw swirls of purple in my mind's vision. Now, I didn't really think anything of it. I'm just noticing how interesting <laughs> And then I felt a warmth kind of slowly encompass me from head to toe. And in that moment, I remember thinking, oh, 
that's weird because it's like this slow feeling. And I just thought, oh, the sun must be coming in from the window and just starting to kind of play tricks on me. But then with full clarity, I felt, and these aren't words that I used before, I felt like a whoosh in energy, like wind but not, come into my back. And, and this was a very concentrated feeling right here in the in the center of my chest, which I would now call heart center, not a word I ever used before. And it was doing slow circles, just like this. Almost like I would make the metaphor, if you can think of like a cartoon when someone has a magic wand and they're doing this, so that that's exactly how it felt. And it was so new. The feeling was so unexpected and new, I had no time to use my mind to judge what was experiencing. I was experiencing, this is real, this is not real. I was just purely present. As that was swirling, it moved very slowly to my shoulder and it took a pause. And then I felt that feeling travel down my arm and into my hand. And then I just knew I knew it without explanation, like how we know the sky is blue, that that feeling went into my dad too. I knew it. And such peace came over me. And almost in a weird way, a joy. I gave him a hug and I said, Dad, I don't know what that was, but I know you felt it too. And you take all that love and light with you. Again, words I didn't really use. Take all that love and light in your core with you and leave the old news behind. I know now looking back that what my words were saying, and this goes for all of us, all of us beyond our complexities, beyond our mistakes, beyond our yucky stuff, our love, all of us. That's the heart of who we are. And I wanted my dad to bring that with him as he left his physical life. And it was my way of saying, I forgive you. I know this isn't who you are and, and this stuff isn't what defines you. It does, doesn't, definitely doesn't define who you are to me because that's love. And so you take all this love and light in your core with you and you leave the old news behind. And I had to leave the house um, just minutes later to go be with my family. And I actually had joy, which is a very odd feeling to have at that time. I, I turned up the music on my way home as I was driving. And I, I remember thinking to myself, what's wrong with me? Like, is this okay that I feel joy right now? Um, and I actually hesitated in returning to the house later because I sort of wanted that to be my last moment with my dad. I just knew we were eternally bonded. I didn't even know why I knew that. You know, I just, it's like I knew it in the depth of me. Um, but the communication didn't stop there. He, he did pass. I did go back to the house and he did pass, like I said, during that moment of time when we're absent of time, um, that evening at around three to four in the morning, we weren't sure what time to write on the death, death certificate. And later that morning, when I went home after, you know, the mortuary came and all that kind of stuff, and I went home and I stopped on my way home to buy a chocolate hostess cupcake. Because my dad, when I was a kid, used to buy me Hostess cupcakes periodically and just leave them places. So maybe he would just leave it under my pillow and there it would be in the morning. And here I am eating my Hostess cupcake at, you know, 7 a.m. Um, he would always find just new, like surprising ways to put them places. And I wasn't ready to tell my son, his grandson, yet that his grandfather had passed. I wasn't ready to have that conversation. But I, at the same time, wanted to do something to honor my dad with him. And so I bought a Hostess cupcake package, one for each of us. And when my son woke up, he came and sat on my lap. He was about five at the time. 
And I just decided to tell him the story about how Grandpa used to always buy me Hostess cupcakes, and we're going to have one this morning in honor of Grandpa. And I actually heard in my mind, because I took out that cupcake for me, and I thought to myself, like many of us women do, I don't need this. I don't need to eat this. I've been eating junk all week. It's been a so stressful week. You know, what am I going to eat this for? And I heard his voice in my mind. And it, that voice said, go ahead and eat the cupcake, honey. But I didn't think anything of it. I just, it's almost like it went over my head. There was an immediate assumption. That's my brain just making up his voice. But we had the cupcakes. And you know what? I ate the cupcake too. And a few hours later, I drove to a park because I just wanted to decompress and go for a walk. But I also finally let the tears of exhaustion go while I was sitting in the car. And as I was having that just release of emotions, I again heard my dad's voice in my mind. And he said, get out of the car, honey. You've cried enough tears over me in your life. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd. I have cried enough tears over my dad in my life, more than a daughter probably should. But it still didn't register as that being anything that maybe, you know, I'm just making that up. I don't know. But I did. I got out of the car and I started walking and I said to myself, I said, gee, dad, I hope you're all right. Because in that time in my life, it's not that I didn't have a faith, but I was more open to this idea that how sure can we really be about exactly what occurs when we pass away? Um, in some ways, I've led a a, a somewhat traditional faith path growing up. And then there were certain times when certain things about that path stopped making sense to my heart as an adult, such as only some people are worthy of an afterlife. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to my heart. So at this time, I was just unsure exactly. And as I said that, gee, dad, I hope you're all right. Instantaneously, Without hesitation, I heard my dad's voice in my mind again, and he said, I'm just fine, Ambie. I'm going to stick around here a while and help some people, and I'm happy about it. And in that moment, I stopped walking. And this is a lesson for all of us, by the way, not just me, because when you, when we notice something, you know, I definitely was lucky enough in that moment to hear that in his actual voice. But sometimes when those in spirit are speaking to us, it can sound like our own thoughts. But when it's a thought that is so sort of random and out there and you would never come up with on your own, that's because the thought's not yours. Not all of your thoughts are your own. And I have learned that repeatedly through the spiritual experiences and my mediumship experiences. When my dad said that, I'm going to stick around here a while and help some people, I would have never come up with that. I, as Amber, if I were inventing that, would have said, heaven's so beautiful, I'm wonderful, I'm here with my dogs and my parents, and you're going to get to see your dog Bailey again too one day, that sort of thing. That's what I would have said, never would I have said. I'm going to stick around here a while and help some people. So that was the first kind of pause that made me go, what is the, what's really happening here? Is my dad somehow connecting with me? Um, but, but that one thing didn't make me go, oh, yes. <laughs> it was a breadcrumb journey that really took probably three months for me to really say, I believe, I believe, I believe, and I know that this is you. And then it probably took me a full year to really grasp the beauty of what is possible really for all of us on one level or another. You know, not everyone is meant to be a medium. All of us, if we desire, are meant to discover that we are connected to the essence of life and connected to the love that is beyond us. I love that. And it's so, so beautiful the way you put it. And that's always one of my questions. If 
you think there's something in your connection or that you have certain gifts or if that's something that that's accessible to everybody to connect to their loved ones in any way shape or form yes yes we are all able possible through our own growth and spiritual journey to connect with our loved ones does it mean we're all meant to have this what feels like extremely present relationship with our loved ones on the other side? Maybe not so much that. I have other loved ones that have passed. I don't hear from them in the same way that I've heard from my dad, but that doesn't matter. I know their presence and I know that they are there, but this is definitely not communication that someone is deeming your, meaning the listener, worthiness of receiving. There is no, this person is more worthy of that than this person. Everyone is innately divine, innately love, and innately worthy. And so I really believe that even though I was given this gift of grace, because this is probably a part of my path, all of us can learn how to uncover the clouds of awareness because we're not really going somewhere to connect with our loved ones, nor are they coming here to connect with us. Everything is already here. If we take away the stuff, there's only here. And it's one thing to hear this and maybe grasp it with our minds, but we really have to follow the path of finding out how can that speak to us through the body so that we experience it for ourselves. The most basic way that's common to all of us is intuition. All, most everyone has had intuitive moments. Now, some people would say, I'm a very intuitive person and others might not use that language about themselves, but most everyone has had very intuitive moments. So what is that? There's different layers to intuition. One of that, one of those layers is simply feeling into the essence of something and having a feeling or knowing about something without any logical cues or explanation. There's intuition that follows logical cues but there's intuition also, I mean, scientists have classified this into different types. There's also intuition that is without logical cues or explanation. That comes from our connection to the essence of life. And so when we can learn that sense of presence and mindfulness, through mindfulness and presence, we are beginning to connect with the essence of life. And it is a journey and it is a path, um, but in that path of presence is where our loved ones are. Actually, if, I, if you don't mind me telling you, because this, this is reminding me and um, it speaks directly to your question. I had a mediumship session about a year ago with a woman who lost her husband and was in very deep grief. And I love this. He, actually, I have this card right here on my desk. He was drawing my attention to this little card that I have. And I just knew it's like he wanted me to reference a card. And so I said, your husband is, this is the very, this is the second thing out of my mouth in this session. Your husband is drawing my attention to this card. And as I say that out loud, I know it's because today is some type of special day it's either his birthday or it's your birthday. And then I just knew the second I said that, I said, no, I know today's your anniversary. And she just started bawling. Yes, today was her wedding anniversary. And then she said, do you mind if I tell you? Last week, the anniversary card that he gave me for the last anniversary when he was present, it just fell off the, the, the dresser. And I had, she had seen me speak somewhere, I don't remember where in this moment, 
And when that fell off the dresser, she just had this thought, reach out to Amber, that woman that you saw that shared her story with her dad. That's because that's not her thought. Her husband put that thought there. And then he came in this connection, helping me with the second piece of evidence that he provided, helped me know that today's their anniversary. He wanted her to have that connection to help her with her grief. The entire connection was about how to help her with the immense grief that she was in. And the advice that he shared was, he helped me feel. She sits in the window sometimes and just lets the sun come in and she kind of with her body soaks that up so I said that out loud and she said well not quite he always tells me to do that <laughs> but I often don't do it instead I sit over here at the kitchen table and you know so on and so forth he wanted her to sit over by that window in the sun because think about think about it all of you what happens when it's one of those days where the sun rays are coming in the window or maybe onto your porch or into a special chair in your yard and you go out there and you just sit there and soak that up? What happens to us? We all calm, our nervous system calms. We stop all the thinking so much and we become present. And then he shared, it's in those moments of presence that I am there. So when we are feeling gratitude, when we're feeling joy, when we're feeling appreciation, our loved ones also can feel those emotions. They can see when we're having negative emotions, but when we feel all those emotions that are associated with gratitude, love, joy, that's where they are because that's who they are now. They are gratitude, love, joy, and appreciation. So when we can redirect some of our emotions into those moments, it's like we're choosing to spend time with our loved one. They see you and love you through the hard times as well. So please don't hear, they're only with you if you're positive. No, but they can really be with you in support and in the emotions when we're in that place of beauty and love and joy and appreciation. And that was his way of trying to nudge her along in her journey of grief, to focus on that gratitude, focus on that presence, focus on that appreciation. And he's still there in the hard times too. And that's such a beautiful story. And I think it reminds us that even though somebody who we love passes on, we still need to focus on ourselves. We still need to focus on finding the happiness and the things that we're grateful for in our own lives, it doesn't mean that our lives haven't been affected or changed. They have, but it still means that we need to move on and live life because that's why we're still here. I'm sure many of us can relate to this for myself too. Often when we're having a really hard, challenging time, we just want to have the negative feelings go away. But all of that is a part of our physical life and our humanness. We can't make them go away. But as to what your point and what you were saying and to what this, this husband was sharing in spirit, we can acknowledge those feelings and have them, but we can make choices also to spend moments that we can muster up the courage and the strength to do what you just shared have those moments of gratitude with intention. I'm grateful for X. It could be, I'm grateful for the sun rays coming in the window, warming up my body right now because that feels so good. I'm grateful for my pet that I get to cuddle and you know, I'm grateful for this beautiful oak tree on my window. Whatever those things are, we can choose those moments with intention. And it's not to replace the negative emotions because those are valid, they're real, and they also, need to just have their time of energy and move through, right? We don't want to repress them. Um, but it's not the only aspect of who we are, the hard stuff. And so we can make conscious choices to bring ourselves back up here when we can. And that gets us through challenging times. It helps us be resilient. Exactly. 
So I have a question that's actually not my question, but a question that my dad asked me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, very suitable to ask you this because he knows that uh, through what I do, I talk to a lot of NDEers and I talk to a lot of people like yourself that are very connected to the spirit world. So he wanted to know if when we pass on, we're still able to choose to guide and communicate and know what the loved ones that are still alive are doing. So I think you almost answered that question, but what would you say to that? So I want to make sure I hear your question correctly. The question is, are we still able to, well, I hear like a couple of things. Are we able to see our loved ones, know what they're doing? And then I heard communicate. Okay. Yeah. 100%. Communicate slash guide, I yeah. think. Was slash guide. Mention. Okay. 100% they are able to see you and know what's going on in your life. A part of how I know that through evidential experiences is that I have those in spirit often, most sessions, tell me about some type of current event in the client's life. So a month ago, uh, oh, the session that I was having with a woman, all of a sudden this person in spirit, her dad is showing me an apple. And with it, I just knew I used to be a teacher. And I knew you're having a career change and it has something to do with teaching. And she said, yes, that is exactly what she's doing right now. She's making a career move and going into teaching. That came from this father in spirit who knew all about this. And then he had messages you know, about her new endeavor. There's also, it's very fun when sometimes those in spirit tell you things about the loved one that the loved one doesn't even know. So for example, in another session, one time um, I had a father in spirit who told me that his daughter, the woman in my session, her husband, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was her brother. Her brother had been to the doctor that day and that the doctor said there would be no surgery. <laughs> Now, I don't always hear something so specific, like a direct phrase. Uh, it does happen though at times. She did know that her brother was having some problems with his arm, but she did not know the severity of that. And yes, he, when she called him later, he did go to the doctor that day. And yes, the doctor had told him there will be no surgery. So it's really fun when loved ones at times not only bring up current events in, in the life, in your life um, because there's they, they want you to know that they understand what's happening in your life. Uh, and it's especially fun when they bring up things about other people that you don't even yet know. Uh, at the same time, I think it's important to say they have a much bigger picture and broader perspective. So there's also no judgment. There's no, they know all your thoughts, all of your thoughts. But there's no judgment because they just get it. They get that we're messy, that being human is messy, that life is hard, um, and they just want to support you on your path. I'll tell you one what last brief example. This is when my mom really believed me that I was having communication with my dad because for a long time I was afraid to tell her. I was very afraid. I didn't, what would she think? What would she say? My mom did not believe in mediumship or anything of the sort. Um, but there was a day that I was working. I was in the middle of a project and this was about four or five months after my dad passed away. And by then I would really recognize him when I felt his presence. It, it happens right in front of me. It's just this feeling that's like a shift in the energy in my space and I know it's him. And so when I felt that while I'm typing away on my work project, I just paused and I took a deep breath just like that. And then I just sort of let go of the thoughts. That's what we do. We set our stuff aside and sort of become and remind ourselves that we're more than, than the stories of our lives. And so in that space of just openness, I heard him say, Call mom right now. She's eating pudding 
and sad. Now that's a very specific directive. And I haven't I haven't seen my mom eat pudding since I was a kid. We always had pudding at home when I was growing up, but I haven't seen my mom eat pudding in decades. And I was actually afraid to call her because what if she's not eating pudding? What if she's not sad? Then I'm inventing all of this. Um, and what does that mean about me? So I didn't call her at first. And then I actually felt my dad's disappointment. <laughs> I felt the emotion. It was non-judgmental disappointment because they are guiding us. They're, they're hoping we listen. They're hoping we follow their nudges. They're hoping that we notice when they put that, whatever it is, sign in our path and acknowledge them and, and thank them and let the love in that they're sending you. And I was afraid, my humanness was afraid. I felt his disappointment. But a half hour later, I finally got up the courage and I called my mom and I said, Mom, can I ask you something? Were you eating pudding a half an hour ago? And she starts crying. And I asked my mom, why are you crying? And she says, yes, I was eating pudding and I'm just so frustrated and sad because she was trying to, to fix something in the house that normally my dad would deal with but it wasn't going well and that grief was just the reminder that she's alone now right and she's got to take care of these things by herself and she went and got some pudding because what do many of us women do when we're sad and emotional <laughs> we find whatever chocolate that we have hidden in the back cupboard right when i shared that with my mom it brought her so much joy because it was my dad saying, I can't fix the problem, but I love you and I'm here and I know you're sad. And then he was helping me in my journey of belief. He was being a guide for me. So yes, they know of the events in our lives. And yes, they can guide us. Absolutely. I think from my mediumship experiences, most of the time that comes through thoughts that we think are our own and they are not. Not all our thoughts are our own. They sound like your own thought, but they're not. That's really beautiful and it's really interesting to start to distinguish, you know, what thoughts might be signs and what thoughts might be your own. Yes, and that is a... Uh, journey in and of itself and even as an evidential medium who has my own connections i sometimes still question was that my thought was that not <laughs> to the point where sometimes there have been moments where i felt the thought that i had was from spirit and i kind of went ah no that can't be right and then later that thing happened the thought actually happened And I went, thank you. And I said, I'm so sorry for not trusting you. And I heard laughter and I heard my dad and others. I don't know who the others were, but I could hear it in like a very fu fuzzy, faint background. I heard them all say, we're used to it by now <laughs> because that's our humanness. We have these beautiful brains and they're wonderful. And they look at the accomplishments that they've made in this beautiful, wonderful life. But our spiritual experiences are absent of the brain. And so we need to use our knowledge to sort of discern what's coming from my own reasoning process and what's coming from a helpful, connected place. And that's a journey of itself. But going back to that idea of presence, becoming mindful, it slows us down. And when our nervous system slows down and we slow down, we become more in tune with the flow of life that's already here. And therefore, you know, when you start to ask yourself questions like, did that come from me? Did that come from a helpful place of spirit? Um, even just asking the question to yourself will take you along the path. Absolutely. 
So how did you, how did this relationship with your father in spirit transform your work into becoming an evidential medium? Oh, wow. That is such a path in and of itself. For a long time, I would refuse to call myself a medium, even though I was having mediumistic experiences. I was having them with my dad, but eventually that that led to experiences with others, um, loved ones of people just in, in my sphere and acquaintances. Uh, it eventually led to, you know, people from 10 years ago in a workplace. All of these meditative experiences were happening. And I, again, it's like this breadcrumb journey. I was having mediumistic abilities. They were being shown to me with evidence that was verified over and over. So it was kind of forcing me to believe, but I didn't want to call myself a medium because that's crazy and scary. And maybe I'm just gullible. And now my brain is doing what our brains do. But a year after my dad's passing, excuse me, we uh, decided to spread his ashes on his birthday, his first birthday without him behind our old log home where we used to live. My parents had a log home built uh, when I was a teenager. And, you know, I had to knock on the door to ask the person who lived there now and make sure they didn't mind that my family spread his ashes behind the house. And so, and it's an eight hour drive for me. It's not a place I ever visit. I had no idea who was living there now. But on this October 15 day, I knocked on the, the person's door a man came out of the house who lived alone by the name of Larry. And I kind of told him a little bit about my dad. And um, <clears throat> I don't think my dad knew him at all. I was telling him how much my dad loved this home and so on and so forth. And, you know, he made reference to the fact of um, how he's living alone now. So I could make the assumption that whoever he was living with in the past has passed away. And he just made this statement about how kind of lonely he had grown. And he said something like, you know, and the, the world is getting more depressing all the time. And, ah, but yeah, I'd love to help you help your dad. How about you know, honor your dad? And so he gave me permission to go behind the house there and spread the ashes. Well, the very next morning, by now I was doing these little five minute meditations. I was having a short meditation and all of a sudden, I feel this woman and this man come into my space, in this energy space. And somehow I just knew, this: these people are for the man in that long comb. This is his mother, and this is his brother. I just knew. I, had, I couldn't give you any logical explanation for how I knew that. I just knew. And so I quickly grabbed a hotel writing pad. And I just start writing down everything that I'm feeling from them. Um, the brother was helping me get, it's a note for how mediumship works. I was physically getting little pinpricks in my stomach, the feelings. And with that, I just knew he had to give himself daily injections for something, maybe diabetes, I don't know, but I knew that they were daily injections. So I'm writing this down. His mother, I just know she loved daily walks and mailbox flowers. I'm writing this down. And then she shows me in my mind a white kitchen potholder square with, I could only see it faintly, but like a green and yellow type of design flower. And then I just had the knowing this is passed down from the family. So I'm writing this all down. And they had a little message each. It was messages of appreciation. Thank you for caring for me and that sort of thing. And then they exited my awareness. And I looked at everything I wrote on the paper and I thought to myself, I cannot go to this man's house and knock on his door and say, I believe I spoke with your, I don't even know. Do you have a mother and a brother that have passed away? One, that is a violation of my personal ethics. One, it could be a violation of his privacy. This is not normal. <laughs> I don't do this kind of stuff, but it felt like a mandate, just like how I felt my dad's non-judgmental disappointment when I didn't call my mom. This felt like you need to do this. 
It's for a bigger picture that you don't understand. So I thought about it and I devised a plan that to me felt ethical, but authentic, which was that I was going to go to his house and just tell him the truth and that, you know, I've been having these experiences with my dad, but I wouldn't say the word medium. And then I think this morning I felt two relatives for you, but it's okay if you don't want to hear that. I wrote it all down. If you'd like the paper, I'm happy to give it to you. It was kind of my plan. I was so scared that I, I know the only thing that propelled me to keep driving down that road and pull in that driveway was the nudge from spirit that I just felt like this was a mandate. And as I stepped out of the car, I noticed a little off in the yard, like a little cross, like when we bury a dog, you know, and we might put a little cross. So I decided to use it as a conversation starter because I had a dog that lived in that home named Thunder. And so as he, as Larry came out of the house, I kind of said, oh, hi again, Larry. Hey, I see that cross in your yard. You must have had a dog. We had a dog too named Thunder. And he looked at me and he gave me this expression that was a half smile and half shyness. And his face to me said, should I really tell her? That's what his face said. There was this big pause. And then he took a big sigh and he said, you know, my brother used to live with me before he died. And my brother loved hummingbirds. And one day a hummingbird flew into the big window here and it died. And he was really sad about it. And I know this is kind of silly, but we decided to bury it. And so we made that marker together. Well, I looked down on my paper and the very first thing that I had written down was special bird in a box. And when I saw that, and he shared that story with me, and after I could sense his timidness and vulnerability, it was again, an I know that was an orchestration from Spirit. Spirit helped me notice that. They knew I would use that to start conversation. They prompted him to not be shy and just tell me the story because it made me feel safe. His vulnerability made me feel like I could be vulnerable with him. And so I told him, Larry, here's the story. Would you like to see this? And he took the paper from my hand and he read all the things. And he said, you know, my brother had diabetes. He had to give himself daily injections before he passed. He verified all these other things. My mom loved her daily walks. She would walk to the mailbox and no one else was allowed to get the mail because when she got too old to do long walks, she had to at least walk to the mailbox. And she always planted yearly flowers at her mailbox every year. And then he said to me, can you hold on a second? And he went to his house and he was gone for like eight minutes. And he came outside holding that white kitchen pot holder with the yellow and green flower. And he said to me, Amber, I had to go into the basement and get through two or three boxes to find this. There is no possible way you could have known about this. For him, it was the thing. For me, it was the diabetes. <laughs> For me, when he confirmed that his brother had to give himself daily injections, that's like that was the thing for me that I just knew. But for him, it was this kitchen pot holder because you can't look that up. I couldn't possibly know about that. And he confirmed her dad, so his grandfather, had made that for her. And it was passed down in the family. And, you know, I don't think he knew what to make of the whole thing. He just kind of was taking it all in. He asked for my phone number. So we exchanged phone numbers. And he called me a week later. And he said to me, I've been thinking about this all week. I believe what happened, but I have to ask you something. Why? Why did it happen? Why me? And I love that he asked this because for a year I had been asking myself, why me? Why did this thing happen to me with this communication with my dad and all these experiences? And I knew the answer. And the answer is because you are worthy. You are worthy of the small miracles and the big ones.
You're worthy of the random smile from the stranger that someone gives you on the street, which sometimes can be a miracle in and of itself for people. You're worthy of the love and connection that is a birthright for all of us. And he said to me, this has changed my outlook on life. Because if you remember the day before, he had told me that he was, he said, ah, the world's so depressing and I'm really lonely. And I could hear it in his voice, you know, he was just kind of depressed. This has changed my outlook on life. It gave him hope. When I put the phone down that day, I said to myself, I'm a medium and I have to accept this. It was the first day that I started really embracing that term. I'm a medium. It's such a beautiful story and it really shows through the examples that you've shared how much support we can get and how much hope we can get by reaching out to yourself or people like yourself and trying to get closure or answers to questions that maybe are still in our minds. Yes, I want to say a couple of things to that, though. Because, yes, evidential mediums that have integrity and are doing this work with evidence absolutely can be that messenger of hope for you. Um, and sometimes, yeah, provide answers, especially why. I think one of my favorite parts of a mediumship session, when someone has been hurt by their loved one, you know, just like there were things that my dad really hurt me. I love being able to express to somebody the why, because the person in spirit will tell me what what's the issue here? Like, how did I cause this person harm? And then they'll help me feel through my emotions and my body what the why is. That's very healing. And the why is never about us, ever. The why is always about their human stuff because we are all messy. All of us are messy. We're complex people. So yes, absolutely it's beautiful to be able to provide that. I want to say though that I think the best gift one can give oneself is the allowance of your own miracles. So when you see that that sign from your loved one, maybe it's the butterfly, maybe it's the feather that shows up out of nowhere, they're going to do the things that are going to work best with your consciousness. Let the love in because you are worthy of that and they are speaking directly to you because they love you. So we also don't need mediums to heal ourselves. You need to heal yourself to know your innate worth, your innate divinity, and your innate connection. A medium can help you bring that to like the present of your mind, right? They can help show you this is real. And yes, you really are connected. And yes, they really are here for you. But but we are, mediums aren't people that have been sapped with some kind of magical ability. Yes, this was probably a part of my life path. So I was given this gift of grace to be able to support people in their path. But you are already this connection. We all are. And so I think the best gift we can give to ourselves is really learning to uncover, uncover that for us, for each of us. You're so right. So for those of us who do want to reach out and feel connected to you and want to find out more, how can they find you and your work? Uh, you can visit my website, which is www.naturewayopen.com. Uh, on that website as well, you'll find not only information about mediumship sessions with me, uh, but on the gifts page, I've created kind of a self-paced guidebook, if you will, for you to be your own guide in uncovering your innate connection with life. It's really using nature as a teacher because I mimicked that after my own experiences, but I call it the Nature's Way Open Guidebook, connecting to self first, your higher self, soul, and then spirit, which I call the essence of life. And so if you're interested in developing your own connections, I would suggest checking that out as well. 
Um, and then you can find me on pretty much most of the social media uh, sites. Facebook is where I'm most active, but I'm on Instagram too and YouTube. And that is, all of those are at Nature's Way Open.